If you have a fabulous shop and it's behind a big, a big wall so nobody knows it, it's of no use to anyone, certainly of no use to you. If you have a website, and this is possibly the most common at the moment, if you have a website or an app that is buried on page 12 of Google, um, an app that nobody's ever heard of, they, it's like way, way down on iTunes, it, it could be, as you say, it could be the best book in the world, it could be the best shop in the world, it could be the best website. It's of no use to anybody because nobody knows it's there. So this is what we're going to talk about this evening. It's how to communicate, what communication is, and how to have a strategy for it. The first time I used the internet was six months before I started my own internet business. Um, so I thought, this is a new thing, and I don't know anything about it. But let's face it, nobody else knows anything about this either, um, so we're all in the same boat. So then I decided, let's come up with something that I can make different from the thing that you buy in the shop. And personalization is the very obvious thing to do with that. Now, if you turn up at a birthday party with a great big bottle of champagne or a really, really funny card, the card is the thing that matters. Now, you could say that that, that expression, that look of joy, on someone's face when they get a Moonpig card is priceless. It's not quite priceless. It's £2.99 plus postage, and you get it from moonpig.com. Now, I knew that that was a winner of an idea, and every time I showed someone, I personalized a card to them, and I showed the investors the idea, they thought, yes, this is a winner of an idea. But that is only the beginning of the problem. You can come up with a great idea, but you still have to tell people about it. So I thought, if I called it the greetingcardshop.co.uk, the problem with that is it's bland. It's very, very bland. And the other problem is, if you put that into Google, all you'll bring up is other greeting card shops. So I decided that I was going to choose a domain name uh, that was, one, utterly unique on Google. If you put it into Google, nothing would come up. Now, the easy way to do that is to take two words that are not normally next to, to each other, put them next to each other, and away you, you've got it. Now, Moonpig also happened to be my nickname at school, but we ignore that. <laughs> we ignore that. And, but there were two words that are not normally together. I put into Google, it wasn't there. It was also, it was also totally non-generic. If you're putting Moonpig into Google, it's because you're looking, for, you're looking for Moonpig. Now, you can find all the people who are find, looking for greeting cards. You can do that through, through AdWords. But if people are looking for you, you want them to come across you and you alone. So there were two things about it. It had to be four syllables, moonpig.com. It had to be phonetic, it had to be easy to spell. And it had to be the kind of thing that if you pass it on to your friends, they're going to remember it. Now, we did have a small competitor um, who, um, who had a, they had one bad, they had a, a name called remind4, letter4u.com. Um, and then they thought that then they went, they went bust. And then they thought uh, that it was bought out of administration. And the new owners thought, right, how can we be more like Moonpig? We will come up with a name a bit like Moonpig. We'll take a ridiculous animal-based name, Funky Pigeon. Um, and then in their own press release, they spelt the word pigeon wrong. So if you're going to have a domain name, make sure it's something that people can spell. You can work out how much it costs you to get a customer very, very quickly. Uh, how much a customer is worth to you over time is the other important part of the equation. And unfortunately, it takes time to work that out. When you start on day one, you don't know how often they're going to come back. But if you start recording that data from the very, very beginning, you can work out, you, you just store all that data and crunch it and crunch it so that you know exactly what will happen if you acquire a customer. And we worked out that we could probably afford to spend about £10 on acquiring a customer because we worked out that over about two or three years, we worked out exactly how many customers, how many customers would come back, how many cards they would buy, and what they would do over a period of time. We also worked out how many friends they would tell. Now, another important hint here when it comes to testing out marketing channels, never spend any more money than you need to spend to find out the answer. There is no point in spending £100,000 on online advertising if you could work out that it doesn't work for £2,000. So we tried a few thousand pounds there, a few thousand pounds there, a few thousand pounds there, and the answer always came back as too expensive. When you found something that works for 10 pounds a customer, you've got to be able to throw money at it and scale it up. And the problem with PR is you can spend 30,000 pounds a year on a good PR person who will get you a few articles. But if you spend 300,000 pounds on PR, you will not get 10 times as much coverage as if you spend 30. You won't. There's some low-hanging fruit there to be picked up. Paid for search is a fantastic way of getting your message out there. The problem that we had as a business is that nobody knew that you could 
personalise a greeting card, so nobody was looking for it. Personalised search only works for the, if, if you have a large number of people looking for what you do. If you'd said to me, five years after we started the business, here is £10 million to grow your business, I would not have known what to do with it. I couldn't find a single channel that was scalable that worked for us. Um, but one thing that did work was viral. And that was that people were buying cards, giving them to their friends. Their friends were finding them funny. They look on the back, it says personalised cards from moonpig.com, and uh, they would go onto the site. So we decided after about two or three years that we couldn't find anything scalable. And we hadn't got much money anyway. So we did no marketing at all for about, for about three years and just allowed our customers to spread the word. And on that basis alone, we were growing at 30 to 40% a year in sales. So we knew we were onto a good thing. We had a tiny, tiny competitor who, uh, very tiny, and they decided to advertise on television. Now, at first, I thought they were idiots. Um, uh, the good thing was that I had been measuring what they were doing. Um, a little bit of low-tech industrial espionage here. Whenever we had a competitor, we would order a card from them every month, and then we'd write the order number into a spreadsheet, and then deduct that order number from last month's order number, which told us how many orders they'd had last month, you see? Simple bit of industrial espionage, particularly in their case when they'd only been selling about five cards a day. They advertised on TV, and suddenly it shot up. And we realized that in the course of the month that they'd advertised on TV, they had got 5,000 customers. And we knew exactly how much they'd spent on TV, because that's a matter of public record. So we knew that they'd got 5,000 customers for 50,000 pounds, 10 pounds a customer. That was our magic number. Now, as it happens, it wasn't their magic number, because their cards were dreadful, and they went bust. Now, if I hadn't been measuring what they were doing, then I, wouldn't have, I, then I would have assumed they advertised on TV, then they went bust, therefore we should never advertise on TV. We, uh, we tried it, and lo and behold, we, we created an advert for 30,000 quid. If you go to most advertising agencies and say, would you create a TV commercial for us, they would probably say, oh, right, you know, 300, 400, 500,000 pounds. The truth is you can do it relatively cheaply. And you can also... Uh, book about a month's worth of space on TV for about £50,000. So we worked out that for £80,000, which incidentally was all the money that we had made in the previous year, for £80,000 we could find out if TV would work for us. That was the entry price. And we did it, and we got our money back straight away. Um, so we doubled it, and we did it to £100,000. And that worked as well, £10 a customer. £200,000, still £10 a customer. We pushed it up every month, up to a million pounds, bearing in mind that we were paying for all of this out of the increased profits from the business. So we, did, we weren't spending any more money on this. This was all coming from the profits coming in. And eventually got it up to about a million pounds a month before the cost of customer acquisition started to rise above £10. We understood what our customers were doing when they heard the message. We understood what they would do and how much we could afford to pay uh, to acquire those customers, and what they began to be worth over time. So without, it's all those bits of information that you need to bring together to understand whether or not this form of communication is working for you. Now, the one advantage that you lot have in your businesses now um, compared with when I was doing it is that nobody had invented social media at the time that we started. So we had a viral effect that was entirely one person speaking to another person in person. And now, of course, with Facebook and Twitter, there are so many ways in which, in which if you get it right, if you get the product right, that that word will spread like wildfire. Um, but the critical thing, starting from the beginning, is that you've got to get the product right because people won't talk about it and spread it and buy it if they don't like it. That seems really obvious, but it is amazing how many dreadful ideas come to fruition. And then the second thing is you have to find, you have to know exactly what that customer is worth to you and how much you can afford to pay for that customer. And you've got to measure the impact of everything that you're doing. And then you've got to find the right channel. A number of years ago at Christmas, um, my son got a present from his grandparents who grossly overspend on him. And I can't control them because they're my wife's parents and therefore I have no say in the matter. And as was typical, they gave him too much money. He comes to me and he says, I know what I want to buy, Dad. I want to buy this, I forget which particular games controller it was, a Super 3D whatever thing. Could have been a Sony, could have been something else. And he said, I want to buy this particularly violent game that comes with it. You can kill people, you can ruin people's lives, you can dismember people. They make really realistic sounds. He thought that was a particularly good feature. <laughs> and he said, and you can get this online, and I can have it 
right away. And I said, why don't we just get it on Amazon? I've been to Amazon a million times. They offer this particular combo pack. And he said, Dad, I've done research. It costs 25 pounds more to get this on Amazon than on PC World Online. So I was in a board meeting Monday afternoon at 4 PM when I got a text from my son. It was a quite upset text. It said, no box. He's a, he's a pithy speaker, my son. Right? I understood this to mean his game console had not arrived, and I think he was quite upset that I did not interrupt my board meeting to call PC World Online to inquire what had happened. So when I got home this evening, he said, what do we do about this? I said, well, I'm sure there's some delivery tracking mechanism. So we went on to PC World Online, and we looked, in vain, I should add, for some sort of delivery tracking mechanism to track your order. We then started to look for a phone number to call. We looked in vain. It took us 45 minutes looking through the site to realize that PC World Online is part of the Dixon's group, and the Dixon's group has a summary helpline for all their products, and we found it. So we called them. This took quite a long time. She checked into our order. She said, ah, I'm sorry to tell you that product's out of stock. And my son said, no, it's not. It said online that you had three in inventory. She said, ah, yes. Well, sometimes our website says that, but it's not true. <laughs> and I said, well, that's kind of upsetting, as you can imagine, to a 12-year-old boy looking for a games console. And she said, I can sympathize entirely. The good news is I can see that there's inventory in the warehouse, and it'll get shipped out tomorrow, I promise. I said, excellent. Thank you for excellent customer service, PC World Online. I don't want you to forget the name of this company. <laughs> And so the next day, I got another text message from my son. He apparently had learned some words in school. He used them. I think they were a test to display emotion. I wasn't in a board meeting. I called him back and said, don't let your mother see that text message. And I got home because, of course, he had not received his product. The next day, nobody called back. The day after that, nobody called back. We were faced with a quandary. My son, at this point, was beyond despair. So I went on to Twitter, and I wrote, Never, ever order from PC World Online. They lie. Fa hashtag fail, 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 fail. <laughs> he said, what's that going to do? I said, I'm not quite sure. One of the people who replied to me is a woman whom I happen to know who is very involved in high street retail. She's a consultant to high street retail companies. She quite helpfully sent a tweet back to me saying, by the way, Doug, Dixon's group head of communications has his own Twitter account, and by the way, this is it. And I said, well, I thank you, Claire. Why don't we send the tweet out again, but actually include the corporate head of communications for Dixon's group, PLC, and I said, let's go further. Let's put their stock trading symbol in there with a hashtag, so all their shareholders as well who track this can share in our disappointment with their customer service department. Not surprisingly, the gentleman who's the head of corporate communications for Dixon's group replied in a minute. <laughs> and he said something to the effect of, can I call you and can we take this offline? <laughs> and I said, no, I think everyone should share with me your response. Feel free. It's just me and my friends and 20,000 people. <laughs> he said, well, the alternative is we can send you your money back. I said, well, why don't we just call it quits and you can send us our money back? Therefore, we exchanged some information about credit cards, and off he went. We then went on to Amazon. We ordered the product. It was there the next morning at 8 AM. Do you know how many people, if you take into account the number of people who retweeted, and the number of people who then retweeted the retweet, and the number of people that each of them had as followers, the extent of our reach in the 48 hours we sent out tweets? I have 20,000 followers. We reached 1 million. 670,000 people. So let's talk about communications, shall we? <laughs> but the reason social media is so important is partly because it equalizes the balance. It empowers the individual in a way that has never happened before in history. And it's partly causing social unrest in nations around the world. It is the fuel to enlighten, make aware, and misinform. It's a tool for good or ill. But what it is, it's a tool of amplification. And what it amplifies is the only thing that marketing is for. A business's purpose in marketing 
is to reach a new prospective customer. And the best and only way to do that, if you strip away all the noise, is word of mouth. It is an extension of this question of credibility that starts at word of mouth and ends at paid advertising. Social media permits us to change the impact of word of mouth. When Mark Zuckerberg changed Facebook forever was when he created the wall and he created the ability for others to see what each other were talking about. At the moment that happened, that was not what Facebook started. They didn't originally have this see what other people are talking about and track other people function. The early days of Facebook didn't have that. When it did have it, the impact was large for Facebook, but it was earth shaking for the world. Because what it did is it meant that when I tell a friend something, I am telling all of my friends something. And that simple act has changed everything. Twitter is not as profound in that sense as Facebook. Now, I've spent most of my time teaching people how to start businesses. And the reason I teach the area around start is because you can go and get an MBA, and you can learn how to manage an existing business but you can't really learn how to start one. The act of starting is qualitatively different. The things you engage in are qualitatively different. And so far as I'm concerned, you are a startup so long as you are still searching for a sustainable, scalable business model. And until you achieve that, you're on a search. You're on a mission to find that model. And much of what he talked about was the search to find that scalable model, and he met with great success. But in my mind, you're a startup until you're there. And the act of starting up is the act of discovery. It's of going out into the world and searching and finding ways to do things. And the number one challenge of almost all startups is invisibility. There are many challenges in starting a business. A lot of people think it's the absence of finance. Truly an issue, I agree. Much less of an issue than invisibility. And the problem is, the Presence of money does not solve the problem. I too would not know what to do with 10 million quid if somebody gave it to me, if I didn't know how to reach people. And I, the easiest place to waste money is in marketing. It is the great black hole. If you gave me a contest between a mediocre product with a great idea to conquer invisibility and a great product with a mediocre idea to conquer invisibility, I know where I would bet. Because a modest accomplishment well, well communicated is far more impactful than the greatest accomplishment that nobody knows about. In the end of the speech, you said you need to um, analyze the, uh, the sales forecast before you can determine your uh, sales channel. So how did you analyze your sales forecast? Um, first of all, you guess. Uh, which is where you start out with a, with a business plan, uh, <clears throat> and, and then your ideas become more and more realistic as the months go by. Um, and uh, you know, within a year or so, we knew exactly what our customers, we had enough customers and enough transactions to know exactly what they were likely to do um, over time. Um, so so my, my message is very simple. If you, if, you, know, you have this amazing, if you have an online business, you have an amazing ability to collect data, you need to crunch that data and understand what your customers are, are, are doing. To what extent, uh should entrepreneurs rely on prospective investors to help them establish those routes to market, thereby overcoming the invisibility trap? You get money and heartache from investors, usually in equal measure. Uh, investors, as a rule, are not there to help you. Now, I am an investor, but I'm obviously the exception to the rule. <laughs> um, angel investors sometimes are helpful because their interests are aligned with you. They make money when you make money. They lose money when you lose money. Institutional investors are not aligned with you. They make money when you make money, and they don't lose any money when you lose your business because they're managing other people's money. And they make money on the carry and the draw. It's not directly relevant, but it's profound when you ask the question, are they helpful in establishing your routes to market? No. Furthermore, I don't mean routes to market when I talk about invisibility. A route to market is largely who am I going to sell through or stand on the shoulders of to reach the market. So does it have a potential impact on the question of how do I reach my customer? Of course it does. And I'm a huge fan of channels. I'm a huge fan of references and of third parties and rewarding those who help me reach a customer. 
And so I spend, I am preoccupied when I work with other people's businesses on figuring out exactly not only what the route to market is, but who am I going to pay along the way, what is their marginal economic value to me, and how do they contribute. Because not all businesses are consumer-facing businesses. Not all businesses have the kind of shape that we've discussed tonight. Many businesses rely upon others to get to market. So the route to market is a very overarching thing that is actually a series of very specific questions. What are my channels? Who are they? What am I going to pay them? Does my pricing take into account? And then what exactly am I going to do to reach those people? But bear in mind, if your route to market is through channels, then the channels become your customer, not the end user. And it's them that you then have to fulfill and satisfy on the way to the market, because they sell to your customer your product. So it becomes a different company with a different focus. Hopefully that helps. For Nick, um, how were you able to raise so much money? How did I raise money? When I first started uh, raising money, um, I produced a personalized card with the name of the person, the, the, the potential investor on it. And it was very easy to explain, this is clearly a better card than anything you have ever seen. Is it not? Yes. So they loved the product. Um, as we went on, of course, we were, you, you encompass, the, 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 the real difficulty of starting business is that you, you encounter reality, which is uh, an unfortunate hurdle. Um, because your business plan can have all sorts of spreadsheet voodoo in it, but when you encounter reality, uh, your numbers have to start getting more real. But the one number that we did have was that we knew that our customers were coming back. Now, you can sell something once, but when you sell again to the same person, that's when you know that you've got a good product. So the, one, the, the way that I was able to keep the interest of the investors as we went through four rounds of investing was the evidence that I had that our customers loved our product, they were buying it, and they were telling their friends about it, and that it was growing organically. For the first five years of our business, largely our growth came from word of mouth, which means that we got something, we got something right. Um, so it's critical for, um, it, that, that evidence was critical for, for, for raising the money. And ultimately, uh, they made the right choice. What you need to hear when he tells that story is a very enviable set of facts. Native organic growth of 30 to 40% a year on nominal advertising with a product that is largely all profit is wonderful. What, whenever you're investing, you're investing on an uncertain set of facts as against an uncertain future. So you look for signals, you look for signs, you look for trends. You're looking at imperfect evidence. And so everything is imperfect. There is no such thing as investing in something perfect. There is no reward without commensurate risk. And like all young companies, he presented at that time risk with reward. Therefore, when you say, how did he keep on getting the money, it's because he kept putting in front of them quite establishable quantitative evidence of the things that investors love the most. And he should have come to me. <laughs> Are you able to tell me about how you would go about patenting a social network site? Uh, if you're going to patent something, it costs you X to p patent it. If you've invented, if you've invented something that can turn lead into gold, yeah, patent that. That's that's good. Um, but for most ideas, they can be circumvented very easily, and a patent is only as good as your ability to defend it. And um, people faff around and waste a lot of time trying to put putting together patents. And, and actually what they need to do is just get in there and do it and do it better than everybody else. I couldn't really patent my idea. Um, uh, about 10 people have tried to copy it. We still have 80% of the market. Um, so it's, a lot of it is about just do it and do it big. Um, I, I mean, that's not to say, you know, that's, that's very general advice and there are some things that need to be patented. Um, and, but and, not social but, networks. But, but, but I, concepts are very, very difficult to patent because people will circumvent them. And, and then you've then got to prove that and then you've got to spend a lot more money. My question is, social networking and word of mouth is very you know, effective for public clients, but what if I'm targeting bigger audience, for example, TfL, airports, and you know, um, companies that are more riskier to find? For example, my way was to go and find CEOs of sustainability on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and I would email them, nothing back. And I find it really hard to really channel my marketing towards the audience that I, I'm trying to target. And I was Sorry, wondering, what are you selling precisely? Um, so I've discovered with my father uh, a new way to generate renewable energy through 
vibration energy, for example, human footsteps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've developed a way to convert that through hydropower. So you know what it'll cost and you know what it'll deliver, correct? Yes. Okay. Almost everything we've discussed tonight is irrelevant to you. Yours is not a marketing challenge. Yeah. Yours is a sales challenge. Marketing is what we do on our way to the moment of selling. In business-to-business -business sales of the kind you're talking about, you need what is known as a reference customer. Because you're doing something quite new, because what you're doing does not have a precedent, though in fairness there are other people attempting to transform kinetic motion into energy, I presume yours is better somehow, we don't have to discuss how, <laughs> um, then you need a reference customer. And what you really need is a partner. In other words, there is a real question here of what is the business model that would be most effective. One business model would be to license it to somebody else in an industry where not necessarily doing the same thing, but produce things that are similar. So a flooring company may be more useful than an energy company. I'm just making this up, but you have to think not so much as to who supplies energy, but who builds and delivers the kinds of things that your thing would be contained within, and does this put, permit them to increase their differentiation in the marketplace? In other words, a reference customer depends on knowing what customer set you want, and what customer set you want depends upon Essentially, what route to market are you choosing? Are you going to license it? Are you going to build it and sell it yourself? Are you going to have create certain elements, key technologies that are then embedded in others who then do the heavy lifting? I don't have the answer to that. Not without a long conversation. But once you've decided what you're actually selling and you can prove the physics of it, I mean prove, and you know the manufacturing cost, then your real goal is to meet a reference customer. And therefore, you have to take a group of companies that fit the criterion that you're looking for. And you have to figure out the person within the company who's responsible for new product development or chief strategy. And they all have similar titles. And you have to find an authoritative way to be introduced to them, which means you need to find others to reference you in. And the way you do that is through the third-party consulting channels that observe those markets. So in every single business-to-business -business industry, there is somebody who commentates and writes authoritative reports. So Gartner Group, for example, is quite famous for covering huge spans. Most of them, oddly enough, are in the Boston area. And there's about 10 of them. And if I'm a large corporation, I buy those reports. I buy them because it's defensible. I buy them because I'm a public company and I need to be seen to be buying them. But I also buy them because they're on the lookout for me for young, innovative companies that I can either take advantage of, compete with, or partner with. And all those things look the same. So you get to them not by going to them, but by going to the people who influence them and are their gatekeepers. And you show them what you're doing and you prove its value. And they will communicate that to them because it's in their interest because that's what they're paid to do. Make sense? Mm. I'm sorry? And she can give you a contact right here. Yes. <laughs> Done and dusted. I think it enables people of all ages to consider the option of entrepreneurship by making it real for them. When if somebody who's a successful entrepreneur is remote or distant or only read about how they succeed in a newspaper and they don't have a chance to talk and interact with them, then they rarely think it's for them. And this is a chance to bring us down to normal where we belong. I think the one thing outside of academia, the one thing that's really useful is to hear real life stories of what people have done and the, the pitfalls and the pros and cons of what they're doing. I think it's always a good thing for people in the local community, especially open events like this, to help people get a sense of the opportunities for themselves to be entrepreneurs. I think it's an enabling tool, essentially. I think that's absolutely great that, uh, that real life entrepreneurs are, uh, are speaking here. Um, talking about real life events. These are great because for start they're free. That's a very, very good thing. And being in London, you have easy access to some of the best entrepreneurs in the world, actually, not just in the country. It's good to hear about communication from people who are obviously very good communicators themselves, so great stories. They did make it feel like it wasn't such a daunting task, so it was quite good and felt like I was in a room full of similar minds, so that was also exciting.